because we're recording it. Oh, darn, you missed all my jokes, though. <laughs> <laughs> if I think the mass is boring, it's not so much a problem with the mass. It's more, in all likelihood, my understanding of the mass that's the problem. Because the mass is made for us, first of all, not just to get something either. That Jesus always wants to, to give us something, and not just something, but his very self in every single Mass, and the grace to make it through that week or for a daily Mass through that day. But more importantly than even that, we are there simply to praise, adore, and glorify God. That is who we are as Catholics, is the beloved sons and daughters who give praise and glory to God. And so not only do we want to receive every time we go to Mass, but we also want to give everything we are, everything we have, in adoration, praise, and glory to our Father, and especially in receiving Jesus. So just encourage you, as you go to Mass, first of all, to show up on time, to make an effort to be there at least a few minutes early, to actually prepare your hearts to receive, to prepare your hearts to give. And I think that so often people are in such a rush that it may be the gospel before you're actually calmed down, the kids are sitting, maybe they're crawling underneath the pews or throwing things at their neighbors or tearing th anything that happens. And yet, if we get there early, if we can prepare our hearts, we can begin to actually enter into the Mass as opposed to just being a bystander in the Mass. And so please get there early. Encourage you as well to see everything that we do that it has a meaning. We won't be able to do everything today, but just for instance, we fast for an hour before Mass. I don't think that this is just some sadistic practice that the Holy Father at some point said, I just want to make people suffer. So we're going to make them fast before Mass. But that our bodies actually matter. I am my body. And so when I fast before Mass, if I feel that hunger, if I feel that desire, I can recognize as well that what I'm truly hungry for is not just physical food, but the bread of life, the word of God. That Jesus himself said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. That do I recognize that, that in feeling that physical hunger, I can relate that to the spiritual hunger that I need to satisfy by being at this Mass. And so what I want to do now is actually just jump into the Mass, and we're just going to walk through, and we'll try to explain some things and why we do what we do, what we do, the reasons behind it, and then especially some of the meaning behind the words. And so we begin simply with the procession. I think it's important to recognize that we're actually going somewhere. As we go through life, St. Paul talks about it as a race. He says, run so as to win, that we're actually moving somewhere. If we're stagnant in life, something's actually wrong, that we're supposed to be moving somewhere. And so in the Mass, the first thing we do is this procession, that we're moving out of the ordinary, out of the world, into something that's holy. And so for this reason, churches should be beautiful. And I don't know, if, has anyone been to Europe before, maybe even Rome? Has anyone been to Rome? And so I was able to do a study abroad semester in Rome, and it was a great blessing. And when you walk into those churches, it really is. It's awe-inspiring. It's amazing. And what these churches were built for was, especially in the uh, Middle Ages, to say if somebody walked into a church, the goal was for them to be able to say, this must be where God lives because it's so beautiful. It's so amazing. If God is here on earth with us, he must live here. This must be his house. And so as we enter into church, and especially as we begin this procession, we come out of the ordinary, out of the world, into the heavenly, into the divine, to encounter Jesus in this great mystery. As we approach especially the tabernacle, where Jesus is truly present, we genuflect. And if you can't genuflect, you can bow, but genuflection is amazing because what we're doing is we're, first of all, just giving praise and adoration and glory to God. But just to think about it this way, in the Middle Ages, a knight would kneel before his king and offer him his sword and say, my life is yours. My sword is at your disposal. Command me to go where you want me to go. Have me fight the battles that you have for me. I will serve you with my life. I will fight for you each and every day. Whenever we genuflect, that's what we're saying with our bodies. My life is yours. Do with me as you will. 
Show me where you are calling me to fight, how you are calling me to lay down my life for you today. And then as we begin the Mass, we begin with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is the sign of our faith. I think so often we miss that, that we might make the sign of the cross 10, 20, 30 times in one day, and we forget the significance of it. That if I go out to Panera Bread, and I'm eating lunch or drinking my coffee, and I make the sign of the cross, first of all, it's an external sign that everyone at once knows that I am a Christian because I've just made the sign of my faith. I'll be honest, most people first notice the collar, and that's their <laughs> the dead giveaway that I'm Catholic. But all of us have the opportunity to present ourselves as a Christian by openly making that sign of our faith. But it's not just an exterior sign, it's also an interior sign. That whenever I make the sign of the cross over myself, I'm reminding myself of what I'm worth. That Jesus was willing to go to the cross for me. That I am worth dying for. That is who I am as his beloved son, as his beloved daughter. I am worth dying for. And so I trace that sign of the cross to remind me who I am and whose I am, and is a profession to the whole world that this is my faith. We then have a formal greeting, and I say, the Lord be with you. Thank you. That we're actually entering into something. And so it's like a, a, an opening address, so to speak. But recognizing that we can't do this alone. That just like Father Sean, or Bishop Sean, don't tell him I said that. Bishop Sean was saying, that we cannot do this on our own. If we ever think we have it all together, something is terribly, terribly wrong. And so I'm offering the Lord be with you. This isn't just words. I'm actually offering for you to receive this gift of the Lord's presence. And then you're saying, and with your spirit, so that I can worthily celebrate these sacred mysteries. Next comes, and I think this is perfect, especially coming off of Bishop Sean's talk, Literally, the first thing we do when we enter into the Mass, then, is simply ask God for mercy. Once again, let's be honest, none of us is perfect. None of us has it all together. All of us fall short of the great call that Jesus has put on our lives, and yet God doesn't reject us. He doesn't push us away, but he invites us in to receive his mercy, to wash us clean so that he can give himself to us. And so we go through the penitential rite, recognizing that, and I actually went through and counted one time, how many times we ask God to have mercy on us in the course of the Mass is like in between 12 and 15 times we're asking God to have mercy on us. And so I think that this is something that we should definitely be focused on is how do I need God's mercy to be made manifest in my life and to actually take that time, the priest will invite us, let's take a moment in silence to examine our sins and ask for the Lord's mercy, not just to think about what you're going to have for breakfast after Mass because you're so hungry because you did the hour fast, but to actually be thinking, what are the things that I need forgiveness for? How does the Lord want to purify my life today? After that, we go into the Gloria, simply giving praise and glory to God. And the funny thing is, once again, we ask for mercy three times in this. But we're really, once again, here not just to take something from God, not just to get something, but to give back to him to praise, adore, and glorify him. And that's what the Gloria is. Next comes the collect. And so this is when we say, let us pray. So is it Silas? Silas, what do you do when I, the priest says, let us pray? And do you bring the book over? Okay, here, can you bring the book over? Perfect. And so one of my favorite things that somebody critiqued our mass about, the priest said, let us pray. And he said, you should make the servers get over there faster because you're saying, let us pray, not let us wait. And what I wanted to ask him is, I'm saying, let us pray. Are you actually praying or not? Because it is supposed to be this time where we're sitting, we're waiting, because, and so this is called the collect. We're literally collecting prayers. That every time that we go to Mass, there is some sort of like standard or um, dedicated intention. So a lot of times it's for deceased loved ones. Maybe it's for the parish community. Maybe it's for victims of uh, the hurricanes that are going on. There will be some dedicated intention. But each and every one of us can come to Mass with a specific intention. Maybe it's for ourselves. Maybe it's for a loved one. Maybe it's for 
the world. Maybe it's for your, uh, your new favorite priest who needs lots and lots of prayers. So if you never don't have an intention, I'll take it. That would be great. But never, ever, ever come to Mass without some specific intention. The priest will say, let us pray, and he'll literally collect these prayers. The next part of what happens is this, this is going to be called the, and this will take place all throughout the Mass. The priest will stand in what's called the orans position. And literally, orans just means praying. So the praying position, anytime the priest is standing with his hands extended, he's simply acting and speaking on behalf of the whole people offering those prayers to God. And so we say, let us pray. We collect all of the prayers and petitions. And then the priest extends his hands and offers a prayer to the Heavenly Father. And this is so important as well that what we are almost always speaking at Mass isn't a dialogue between you and the priest. There are dialogue parts, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Almost the entire Mass is a prayer of the entire people with the priest as the head oriented towards God. That I'm not speaking back and forth to you. I've been, for whatever reason, I still don't know why God did this, but chose me to be a priest so that I could offer sacrifice and speak to him on behalf of the people, receive his graces, and give those back to you so that he can be made truly present. How amazing is that? That God actually wants to communicate, to be with, and to give himself for us. And so as you listen to those prayers, they'll always be addressed to God the Father through Jesus Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Silas. Great job. Next comes the readings. And so often, I think that, well, we'll just do this. Is Often people say something like this to me. Father, God never speaks to me. Or I never hear God speaking to me. I hear him speaking to other people. And what I want to ask them, first of all, is, have you ever been to Mass and heard the word proclaimed? Or have you ever read Scripture? Because if you've done either one of those two things, God has spoken to you. Because what we hear at Mass is the word of God. Jesus is speaking to you. Whenever you read scripture, you are reading, taking in, receiving the word of God. He is speaking to you. So the question isn't, does God speak to me? The question is, am I listening? And so really encourage you, get to Mass early and prepare your heart for whatever it is that Jesus has for you. And do the readings ahead of time. Have those prepared already so that you know what's coming and so that you can receive in that moment whatever that gift, that grace is that Jesus has for you. Because Jesus doesn't just want to speak to us collectively. He certainly does. But he also wants to speak to each and every one of us as an individual. <laughs> also encourage you, and this is a, a Matthew Kelly thing. He encourages us to have a mass journal. Does anyone have a mass journal already? There you go. You, you're back on the good list. So, <laughs> But it is really, really, I think, a, a phenomenal thing to be able to do is to record, how did Jesus speak to me today? What was the gift that he had for me? What was the grace that he had specifically for me? And then to be able to go back and to see the progress that Jesus has had in our hearts. I, I really do. I think that's a great thing. So I encourage you, have a mass journal that you bring every week. And if uh, Father Steve asks you why you're writing during Mass, you can tell him, Father Jim said it's okay. And we'll, <laughs> we'll see what he says. Next comes the Gospel. And so the Gospel, first of all, that is Deacon Larry, right? So the priest is going to give Deacon Larry his blessing. May the Lord be in your heart and on your lips so you may proclaim his holy Gospel worthily and well. Right? And so as a priest, as a deacon, what we need to do is, in a certain sense, get out of the way. Get ourselves out of the way so that we can become a conduit of the word of God, a conduit of God's love, a conduit of his mercy and his grace. And so what we're saying is, cleanse my heart, cleanse my lips so that it's not me doing all of this, but so that I can become a conduit of you speaking to your people. And then we always say, the Lord be with you, with your spirit. May the Lord be in my mind, on my lips, and in my heart. 
And this isn't, and once again, I just don't think we take the time to actually savor these prayers because what am I actually asking? As we're about to hear the gospel, Jesus' words proclaimed, Lord, be in my mind. Be what I think about. Be what's running through my mind. Not just the YouTube videos that I watch, not just the problems at home. May it be you in your word that's always in my thoughts. Lord, be on my lips so that what I say will actually come from here, from your word, from your truth. Be on my lips so that what I say might be infused with your grace. And then be in my heart. Transform me, my being, my person to become more like you so I'm actually changed by what I'm about to hear. And then the gospel is proclaimed. And once again, this is Jesus' word speaking to you. Am I listening? Next comes the homily. Has anyone in this room ever heard a bad homily? Okay, has anyone ever had a good homily? Hopefully, yeah. All the St. John Fenton people, raise your hand, right? <laughs> I think it's so important for us to recognize that what we come for in Mass is not the homily. Hopefully, God is going to work through that priest, through that deacon, to deliver his word in a powerful way that connects the scriptures, the readings, with our daily lives, that challenges and encourages us. But the point of Mass is not the homily. We are here to receive Jesus in the Eucharist. We're here to receive his word, to allow him to speak to us, to praise, adore, and glorify him. And when we understand that, the homily becomes almost like icing on the cake. And I do think that so often people have this misunderstanding that, well, it's the priest's job to entertain me. Hopefully, there will be times where you're entertained. But once again, that's not even the point of the homily. That the point of the homily is to take the readings, to apply them to our daily lives in some sort of encouragement, in some sort of uh, challenge, but not to just entertain us. And even if the priest gives the worst homily in the entire world, which once again, God forbid, ever happen, but you will not have missed out at Mass because it was a bad homily, because Jesus has already spoken to you in the readings, and he's about to give his very self to you in the Eucharist. How amazing is that? Really encourage us. Pray for your priests, especially as they prepare their homilies, but to recognize that if I don't get what I want out of the homily, that is not a reason not to go to Mass or not to go to this Mass, but rather to simply begin to pray for that priest or deacon and allow myself to be transformed first by the Word of God and especially by his body and blood. Next, we stand up and we do the creed. Uh, and I heard a priest one time, and he did this very sarcastically. I don't, even, I don't think I can do it as well as he did. And he said, everyone, please stand for the creed. And can you believe that we have to do this every single Sunday for thousands and thousands of years? We've had to do this over and over and over again. And he paused and he said, isn't that amazing? That for thousands and thousands of years, we've done this every single Sunday. What an amazing gift this faith is to us, that has been passed down to us, that has been given to us, and literally has been died for. That there are people, even in the world today, that if they profess this faith the way we do in public, they could be killed for it, and yet they're willing to profess it anyway. What an amazing gift this faith is. But once again, so often I don't think we stop to savor these prayers, to savor these moments as we go through Mass of my freedom to profess this faith, but also the opportunity to do this and to allow this, these truths of the faith to truly penetrate my heart. And encourage us as well to go through the creed on our own time in order to say, do I really believe this? Do I really understand this? Do I need to go through the catechism and learn a little bit more about my faith so that when I say, I believe in the resurrection of the body, I know what I'm talking about? Do I really believe what I'm professing? And this is also an amazing prayer because it's both personal and communal, just like the whole Mass. That it's personal because we say, credo, I believe in one God. 
And yet we're all saying it together as one body of Christ. Because this is what unites us, is this faith. Next comes the prayers of the faithful. And so what we've just done is we've entered into God's house, come out of the world into his house. We've asked for God's mercy. We've signed ourselves with that sign of our faith. We've heard him speak to us. We've professed our faith. And now we ask him for the things we need. Really encourage you. Where does my needs come in all of this, my wants and my desires, is all of those other things came first. And I think so often, and mea culpa, mea culpa, I'm guilty of this, go into my prayer time and say, okay, God, here's my checklist, here's the things I need today, you take care of that, I'll see you tonight. (laughs) That's very often the way it works. And so am I actually stopping to ask God simply for his mercy? to sign myself with the the sign of our faith, the sign of the cross, or do I jump right to the prayers of the faithful? Say, okay, God, here's my stuff. Here's what you need to do for me. I'll see you later. Encourage us, whenever we go to prayer, to take the Mass almost as a model, to be saying, this is what my prayer life should look like, asking for God's mercy, remembering who I am as his son and daughter, receiving his words spoken to me, and bringing my prayers to him, but not only that. Next comes the offertory, one of my favorite parts of Mass. How many people have ever checked out during the offertory? Maybe thinking about how the priest's homily was really, really bad. Or if you're at St. John's, really, really good, right? Is that <laughs> the offertory is this amazing time that we've just heard God speak to us. Hopefully the priest or the deacon has opened up the word for us in a new and powerful way. And we sit down now in order to offer ourselves to God. And the amazing thing about this, too, is often now we, there's groups of sisters, groups of nuns, religious, that, that make those communion hosts, and the same thing with communion wine. Well, what would have happened in the early church is this was their gift, literally their offering, is they would have families from their local communities, their local uh, house churches, would make that wine, would make that bread, and then they offer it to God. The question for us isn't just, what are we offering in terms of bread and wine, but what am I offering in terms of myself? That each and every one of us as a Christian, as a Catholic, is called to be a good steward of the gifts that God has given us. Being a good steward means giving back of my time, my talent, and my treasure, giving that back to God. So at Mass, you've probably had the baskets passed around, or the, the ushers have those poles, and they can actually like poke you with them to get you to give, you, give a little bit more of your treasure. And so treasure's actually not even that hard of one. I encourage you, never go to Mass without offering some, some treasure, something that you have. And once again, I remember as a kid, my parents kind of ingrained this in us. So we'd come with a penny or a quarter, but every single Sunday we were putting something in that collection basket. We are trying to give back to God something that he had first given to us. Second is our life. Our time is a gift from God. Am I offering that back to him? Each and every one of us is at a different stage in our life. We've all been given uh, different talents as well, but that doesn't mean that we have nothing to offer. During the offertory, encourage you each and every time you go to Mass, to think, what am I going to offer back to God today? My treasure? My time? Maybe the Lord's calling me to volunteer in some new way. Maybe he's calling me to pray a little bit more. Maybe he's calling me to some sort of evangelization. What is the time that I can offer God today? The third thing is that talent, that each and every one of us is utterly and completely unique, completely unrepeatable. God has made us with a spirit very specific set of gifts and abilities and even weaknesses. Am I using those just for my further gain, or am I actually using those for his greater glory? That in uh, it's Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Let your light shine so brightly before men that seeing your good works, they may give glory to your heavenly Father. Have I allowed those gifts that God has given me to shine forth, not so that I can receive all the praise and glory, but so that I can allow that person through that light that shines forth from me to give praise back to the Father. Encourage us during the offertory never just to take a break, 
Never just to criticize the priest's homily or tear it apart, but really to offer, to think about what can I give God, my time, my talent, and my treasure. Oh, we'll, we'll do this now. I was going to do this later. But, and isn't this amazing? So we give God bread and wine. What does he transform them into? His body and blood. And then does he keep those for himself? And say, hey, you gave me this gift, <laughs> sucker, right? Now they're mine, you can't have them anymore. God gives, we, we give God the gift that he has first given us. And then when we offer that back to him, he makes it amazingly better and gives it back to us. And so God has given us this gift of life. I think that so many of us are scared of what happens if I give my life back to God? What happens if I give my talent or my time? He's going to take something away from me. When the reality is just the opposite. That when we offer ourselves, our time, our talent, our treasure to God, he doesn't take it away. He makes it infinitely better and gives it back to us. What an amazing gift. But it takes that trust. It takes the faith and the courage to say, Lord, my life is yours. Do with me as you will. And this is what we say then, is that the priest is saying, uh, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for these gifts. And so saying, God, you've given us this bread. You've given us this wine. We give it back to you so that it may become your body and blood. What an amazing gift. And then next we have the hand washing. Did we have this? We're, we want to keep Silas working here today. And so the priest comes over, says, wash me, O Lord, from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. Thanks, Silas. Great job. And so this is really just like before the gospel. We said, Lord, purify my heart, purify my, purify my heart and my lips that I may proclaim your words. You may think that priests are perfect. Thank you. I'm honored, obliged. But we need God's mercy too. And so especially before celebrating the Eucharist, going, washing our hands and saying, Lord, I am a sinner in need of your mercy. Wash me clean. So that once again, it's not me showing through, but rather it's you showing through me. Help me to get out of the way so that you can be made manifest to your people. And then the priest will say, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, our almighty Father. And so what is the priest's sacrifice? The bread and the wine. What we just offered. What is your offering? Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours, whatever you just offered during the offertory, your time, your talent, and your treasure, put that on the altar. And I love this image. It's, uh, I think it's Romans 12.1. It's St. Paul saying, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord. That what we should do, and once again, I try to do this without perfect success, is every time we go to Mass to put ourselves up on the altar and to say, Lord, my life is yours. I am the sacrifice that I want to give to you. Take from me what you will and give it back to me as you would have it, perfected in your body and blood. But to always make sure that we're not just saying, okay, now it's the priest's turn to work, but that we are actually offering ourselves as well. Then we enter into the Eucharistic prayer. And so as we go through this, there's, this is a problem. We're going to make it. We're okay. We do the preface first, and then we do the holy, holy, holy. And so we do this sanctus where we recognize that we are not alone. And once again, I think it's Romans. We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses that the mass is this moment where time and eternity meet because we're breaking into eternity by allowing the eternal sacrifice to break into this space and this time and be made truly present, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And so what I would say with this is, If you have ever lost a loved one, you can never be closer to them than you are at Mass. Because if we truly believe that these people are with Jesus in one way or another, and if we truly believe that Jesus is here, that he has broken into time 
out of eternity and it tr is truly present, we can never be closer to our loved ones than in that moment, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses where God breaks into time and place in the church. We then kneel simply out of humility to recognize that this is the moment in which this amazing miracle is about to happen. We kneel to give that praise, that adoration, that glory to God. And that the words of institution, this is my body and this is my blood, we as Catholics believe that transubstantiation happens. That this is no longer ordinary bread and wine, but rather this has truly become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And this is just baffling. Why would God do this? How could he do this? And I just want to give this analogy first. Is there's, this may surprise you. There's nothing else in the world that works this way. Right? It, just, it just doesn't. Transubstantiation. But there's something that works kind of in the opposite way. And so if we were to look at a caterpillar, it's like this little kind of slimy bug with lots of legs and kind of gross but not as bad as centipedes and it's okay. And what does a caterpillar become? A butterfly, right? It goes into its cocoon and it emerges as a butterfly. That we would say its accidents, its exterior appearance has changed, but its being, what it is, has, is the same. And so the caterpillar, its accidents change, but the substance remains the same. The Eucharist is just the opposite. That the accidents, the appearance remains the same, but at that moment of consecration, as the priest says those words, the substance, the being of those objects, the bread and wine, transforms into the body and blood of Jesus. And we do, once again, recognize that this is a great mystery. So we say, the mystery of faith. And then we have that memorial acclamation. This is just an amazing thing, too. That Then we go through, and now that Jesus is truly present, and once again, guilty of this as well, but that next set of prayers, I'd say that most people kind of tune out for. But really encourage you, listen to what the priest is saying. What we're doing is, now that Jesus is present, we're kind of trying to like ride his coattails, so to speak, up into heaven. And so we're offering prayers for the whole church, for Pope Francis, for Bishop Boyer, for ourselves, for those we love, for our church community. And all of those prayers we're offering and saying, Jesus, as you take these gifts up to heaven— Accept these prayers that we offer you as well. We then end this part of the Mass by saying the great Amen. And Amen simply means, I believe. Let it be done. And in a certain sense, I would stake my life on this, that this is true, that this is real. And so how we end is not by saying, man, this is really confusing. I don't really know what to believe. We're saying, Amen. I believe. This is true. I would stake my life on this. And then we stand up, and this is awesome. So just think, what, what we've done is we've humbled ourselves, we've knelt down out of reverence and out of adoration and praise and glory to God. And then as he's made present here, he has raised us up as his sons and daughters. And so as we stand up, what do we do? We pray the Our Father, that God has raised us up in and through his blood by washing us clean in order to become his sons and daughters so that we can call God our Father. And so we speak those words, calling out to God as our Father, as a prayer together. And what an amazing gift that is to truly be able to call God our Father. Next comes the sign of peace. And so, and especially being at the high school now, I would say that the kids' favorite part of Mass is probably the sign of peace. And... <laughs> They actually kind of go insane. It's very disconcerting. It's like, hey, you over there, I'm going to come give you the sign of peace. And it's madness. But <laughs> the sign of peace is not another time to take a break, just like the offertory. <clears throat> but Jesus says this, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. We have brought our offering, brought our gift to the altar, but the question now is, is there unforgiveness in my heart? 
Is there somebody that I need to ask for their forgiveness? Is there somebody that I need to apologize to? Is there somebody that I need to make peace with? The sign of peace is not just this time to take a break, to go and give a bro hug to somebody or high five or a handshake, but truly a time before we offer this gift, before we receive Jesus, to make sure that we are at peace with those around us, that we are in communion, that we have been reconciled with one another. The next part is called the fracturing right? And this is, we, we don't have a host, do we? That's okay. So if you look at the hosts, they're almost always going to be just perfect circles. They shouldn't be chipped. They shouldn't be broken. There shouldn't be blemishes in them. Not because we, we don't want to gross people out, but because we are truly consuming the unblemished lamb. Jesus, who is completely perfect, And so we have unblemished hosts to signify that to us. But then what do we do is we fracture it. We break it in half and then place a small piece in the chalice. And isn't this amazing that Jesus didn't deserve the cross? That wasn't something that he merited through his words or his actions, but rather something he freely chose to do. The perfect Lamb of God freely broke himself for us. And that's what that rite represents. Jesus being broken so that he can pour himself out for us. The priest then places a small piece of the host into the chalice and says, May this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. And in the early church, this is I, and it's actually the patron saint of altar service. His name was Saint Tarsisius. And so Saint Tarsisius was an altar server in, in the Roman church, Uh, before the legalization of Christianity. So they're having mass in the catacombs. And what happened is the bishop would celebrate mass himself, but then had other priests who were celebrating mass around the city. They would fracture the host and then actually bring small pieces of that one host to all those different churches. And that would be the piece of the host that they place into the chalice. And this is, we are one church, one holy Catholic apostolic that, This was a representation of what we're doing is not just isolated. What happens at Holy Redeemer happens here, but it's intimately united with every other Mass happening all throughout the world. And this was just a representation of that, that this one host is going to all of these different churches, uniting us into one body. Next, we say the Lamb of God. And (laughs) once again, what an amazing gift to be able to call Jesus the Lamb of God who has been sacrificed for us to pay the price for our sins and to pour out his blood to wash us clean. And once again, what Bishop Sean was saying is that all of us are in need of God's mercy. And I love what we say, literally the last thing we say before receiving communion, Lord, I am not worthy. And I can't tell you how many people I've had come to me and whether it's confession or whether it's for some sort of counseling, say, Father Jim, I feel so unworthy. (laughs) I've never said this, but I want to say is good because you are, (laughs) right? You're not worthy, but that's not what matters. What matters isn't me making myself so perfect that Jesus will love me. What matters is me recognizing my position as a sinner who is in need of God's mercy, but has been raised up as his beloved son and daughter, washed clean in his blood. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, to enter into my body, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. What an amazing gift that Jesus gives himself to us, not because we've earned it, merited it, deserved it, but simply because he loves us that much. What an amazing gift that is. And then we receive communion. And this, is, this should be the highlight of our week. There's saints that talk about, and most of these were, were priests, and so they would talk about their day oriented around the Eucharist, the first half of their day being looking forward to, preparing their hearts for receiving Jesus in the Eucharist, and the whole second half of their day simply thanking Jesus for that gift of the Eucharist, going to bed, getting up, and doing it again. That the Eucharist was truly the source and summit for their entire day. 
And that's what it should be for us. Whether we just go to Mass on Sundays or if we go to daily Mass, this should be the focal point, the center of our entire lives. But do we see it that way? Or have we become just ingrained in this mentality of, okay, Jesus, I'll step out of my normal schedule to give you this hour. I'll do my church thing and then step back into my daily life. We must allow the Eucharist to truly transform us. And then as we receive communion, I think that Dan's sending me subtle messages that we're almost out of time. We're almost there, though. We're, we're, we're cruising. Uh, for reception of communion, I encourage you to do it in whatever way you see best. Some people receive on the tongue out of reverence that they don't want to use their hands. Some people receive on their hands. If you do that, I simply ask, make a throne out of your hands. Allow Jesus to be placed there. And it's actually, Bishop Boyer says he loves this, that the humility of Jesus to be willing, like the God of the universe who holds the whole world in his hands is willing to be held in our hands to give himself in that way so that we can consume him. And we consume him so that he might be intimately present in us and begin to transform us from the inside out. Once again, what an amazing gift, but do I recognize it? Am I preparing my heart to receive? Or have I just begun to believe that this is just what I do on Sundays? That when I receive Jesus, the God of the universe is literally abiding within me and transforming me from the inside out. And so I encourage you, as you return to your seat, to pray in whatever way is best for you. That often, I think that there's some parishes, everyone stands, everyone kneels, everyone sits. But to remember, we are our bodies. How we stand, how we kneel, how we sit matters. And so whatever way you pray best, this is the holiest moment of your week. Pray in whatever way you want to. But really enter into that prayer, not watching how do other people receive communion, who's that kid that's screaming in the back, but just to enter into that moment and to receive that grace from God. Next, the priest will purify the vessels, not wash the dishes, right? (laughs) This is incredibly important. One drop of the blood of Jesus was enough to change and save the world. One speck of his body given for us was enough to save the world. This is why we have such reverence for purifying the vessels that if there is one drop of blood left, if there is one crumb of body left, we want to make sure we treat that with the dignity and respect it deserves. And so we purify the vessels. We never, ever, ever do the dishes. After this, we have our final blessing. And so the priest will once again say, let us pray right? And so we'll have you come over with the book again. Thanks, Silas. And so once again, let us pray, not complaining that we're waiting and not just saying, okay, priest, time to do your job up there. But am I actually praying? We had that intention at the beginning of mass. Am I bringing that back to fruition now, full circle at the end of mass? And then is there anything that I need going forward that the Lord can give me to help me through this week or through this day. Let us pray. And then once again, if you listen to the words, it will be directed towards God the Father. Okay, thanks, Silas. This may surprise you to know, announcements are not a part of Mass. Does that surprise anyone? Right? I just think this is craziness. But So I, I think I can probably speak on behalf of the Holy Redeemer staff that read the bulletin, right? It's all there. We don't need to do announcements, but that's besides the point. So announcements are not a part of Mass, but then comes the sending forth. Ita Misa Est. You're being sent out. And this is my favorite kind of uh, ending for Mass is go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Now, once again, think of what we've just done. We've entered into God's house. We've signed ourselves with the cross, remembered who we are. We've asked for God's mercy. We've heard his word proclaimed to us. We've brought our prayers before him. We've professed the creed. We've received him into our very bodies. And now we're being sent out to go and announce the gospel of the Lord. This is not, really, mass is not something that's just meant to stay within the four walls. It's meant to be taken out. So that when we are transformed, we become transformation for the whole world. 
This is so amazing that God has chosen us in order to do this. That he doesn't need us. Once again, we can't merit this. But he has chosen us and loved us to the point of sending us out as his representatives to the world. And then we close. Thanks be to God. And as a kid, I thought we were saying, thank God it's over. Right? (laughs) But what we're literally saying is, thank you, Jesus, for this gift you've given me. Thank you for speaking to me in your word. Thank you for giving yourself to me in this miracle of the Eucharist and for sending me out to be your representative. Thanks be to God. Let's close with a prayer. Jesus, we thank you so much for the opportunity to open our minds to a greater understanding of the Mass. We ask, Lord, that each and every time we come to Mass, we might truly receive you as worthily as possible, allowing you to transform us by speaking your word to us and by receiving you into our very bodies. We ask as well that you may send us out to be your representatives, your aroma in the world, that truly you might change the world in and through us. We ask for your blessings upon all gathered here Allow us to encounter you today, to receive your love and to share it with those around us. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.